recorded on location at Aspen Ideas Health in Aspen, Colorado. Well, we all see him in, on the news, informing us of healthcare stories that are important to you and your loved ones. We also followed him during the pandemic as the COVID vaccines were rolling out in his efforts to receive, to find them, and then to receive it. If you do get information, whether it's from the CDC, whether it's from me, whether it's from social media, second check that, third check it, you know, just look at other sources. And if you get something from a source you think might be a little, little questionable, look at a sound source and then look at a second sound source and make sure you get that information. Our guest today is Dr. John Torres. He's the senior medical correspondent for NBC News. And we have the great pleasure of seeing him and speaking with him live and in person at the Aspen Festival of Ideas Health. Now I think that's the struggle is moving forward and going, how do we do this? How do we incorporate social media? Because that's our life these days, and especially the, the younger you know, children and adults as they're growing up, that's going to be their life. And that's where they're getting most of their information, like you say. But how do we make sure that they're getting this accurate information? And part of that is the companies themselves saying, you know, let's not give a platform to information that we know is incorrect. And this is Conversations on Healthcare. Well, Dr. John, if I may, yep. uh, welcome to Conversations Thank on you. Healthcare. You know, you're at this interesting intersection, both as a journalist and as a physician. Uh, and both of those industries are sort of struggling with issues around trust. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's in, interesting because that trust has eroded over the years. Yeah. And when I first came into medicine in the 90s, you know, the doctors were still held at that point of like, you know, I can get information from them, I can believe them, I can trust them. And over the decades, it's now evolved for some reason to this, you know, second guessing, are they telling me the truth? What's going on? What's happening? Uh, it, it's an interesting world. Yeah. You know, at the height of the pandemic, uh, I think there was a survey that showed that 41% of the country uh, trusted mainstream media, right? And uh, that's uh, a real challenge. NBC News being really a sort of a, one of those mainstream medias. I'm just wondering how we move from that point to uh, increasing trust levels. And, and you know, what it comes down to, and this is what I talked about a lot during the pandemic too, is unfortunately there was a lot of misinformation out there. There was a lot of miscommunication of information out there. Yeah. And both those together were causing the struggle of trying to get the information to people in a way that they would understand, number one, but also believe it. And part of it is during the pandemic, what you were seeing is you were seeing t science happen real time. Yeah. And typically what happens is in the, in the world pre-pandemic, pre-social media, science would come out with experiments and they'd do them for 10, 15 years, and then they'd come out with a result that had been experimented on for 10, 15 right. years. Well, during the pandemic, we were calling it science by press release or science by social media release, where somebody somewhere would say, hey, I tried this on three patients and it worked on two of them. <laughs> and people all right. of a sudden like, hey, that works. That's right. And then as doctors, as journalists, it was a struggle trying to disprove a negative, right. trying to say, well, it doesn't work because we don't know enough about it, or it doesn't work because it doesn't make sense from a medical point of view. And so that's a, that's a struggle, and that's going to continue to be a yeah. struggle. Well, I want to pick up on the social media part, but I think you're right. It was kind of Operation Warp Speed when it came to the release of information as much as the yeah. release of vaccines. But um, sort of building on the statistic you used, 30 percent of uh, or the majority of people under the age of 30, I guess it is, get most of their information from social media. You're a news correspondent, but it seems like you have to make that choice of how much to engage in social media, often particularly refuting information that's coming out. Is that part of your role to be on Twitter, to be on the news feeds and just pushing back and correcting things as they come out? You know, and during the pandemic, it started off as, as a, a fairly big part of my role of making sure I was on social media and I was on a different platforms and addressing people's concerns and stuff. And then you realize pretty soon that when you start trying to engage individually, yeah. it turns into this, uh, you know, unfortunately this big circle of information and misinformation going around and you end up getting into these almost word battles with people trying to get them to understand what you're talking about in a very brief time period. And, you know, we've all been to doctors, we've all looked at medicines and vaccines and things, and it's, it's complicated. And so you can't do it in a certain number of letters that right. you might get in the social media. You can't do it in a certain number of, of, you know, certain seconds, you know, it takes minutes, hours to explain these things. And so, so, you know, now I think that's the struggle is moving forward and going, how do we do this? How do we incorporate social media? Because 
that's our life these days, and especially the, the younger you know, children right. and adults as they're growing up, that's gonna be their life, and that's where they're getting most of their information, like you say, but how do we make sure that they're getting this accurate information? And part of that is the companies themselves saying, you know, let's not give a platform to information that we know is incorrect, you know, give an information, give a platform to the information that might be correct, and we're still struggling to learn information that's correct, but for the obvious misinformation, we have to get a better handle on that. Well, you know, you're breaking so many interesting news stories and introducing people to new concepts. I know you have a long history in the military, uh, United States Air Force, yes. I think eight years? Eight years active duty uh, and then 24 years Guard 24 and Reserve, years, so yeah. 32 total. Yeah, and I know you recently broke a story uh, that was quite interesting about the veterans affairs using psychedelics uh, and really with some interesting outcomes that are happening. I, I think people might be fascinated to understand how you came to that story and maybe tell us a little bit about what's going on because it's having an important impact for post-traumatic stress disorder and other Exactly. Problems. And because of the war on terror, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom, all these different uh, wars and conflicts we've been involved with, plus because of the pandemic. And this is not a military specific thing, but this is a population wide thing of PTSD becoming right. more and more Absolutely. prevalent. And so, the, you know, the main objective here is trying to figure out how we can better treat PTSD with the main goal of being curing PTSD, if we can get to that point. And so there's a lot of different theories and, and, and medicines out there that could potentially work. And kudos to the VA for taking that step and saying, let's look at this Absolutely. because the psychedelics, we're getting information that it seems to be working because of the way it works on the brain. It seems to be able to alter the brain where it can handle that information a little bit better and it can handle that PTSD a little bit better. And so the VA, again, kudos to them. They were able to take that step and say, let's try this on veterans. And one of the th reasons they did this, and this is what we found out in the story when we were doing our, our investigations early on, is a lot of veterans were going to Mexico to get psychedelic right. treatment because they had heard anecdotally that, hey, this is working. Mm -hmm. And so they were so desperate to get something, they would go down there and get the psychedelics. And a lot of them were coming back going, I, I, I'm so much better. I have a better handle on my PTSD. It wasn't cured, but I'm certainly better. And so the VA listened, which yeah. is something that sometimes they, they get a bad rap for not listening, but they listen. And they said, let's try this trial and find out. It's still ongoing and it's still working its way through the system, but it's showing promising results. And the interesting part of it is, with psychedelics, it's not, the, and, and this was probably the big important message that came out of the story, and I wanted to make sure that we were adamant about making sure that message was presented, is it's not the psychedelic that's doing, any, that, that is actually fixing them. What the psychedelic is doing is it's lowering their inhibitions, letting them bring that trauma to the surface, so then the therapist can work with them on that trauma, which is something they weren't able to do before. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, it, you know, it was a story that we had heard through social media and through other avenues that veterans were going down to Mexico to get this, they were having successes. And so then we talked to the VA and they said, yeah, we're starting to do ex you know, these experiments on this and studies on this to find out if it's working. It well, looks I thought like it you is. did a great job of illuminating that it's not just the drug, it's the therapist alongside guiding somebody through that experience. And that was, they, they were adamant when I was interviewing yeah. them. They said, you have to make sure that you yeah. include this. And, That's and right. as, a, as a physician journalist, right. one of my big mandates when I first came into this job is, you know, one of my big things is I took an oath, do no harm. I've taken two right. oaths in my life. One is to protect the constitution Constant. because yeah. of my military and then do no harm because of my medical. And so uh, with that oath, I'm never going to violate it. And I want to make sure that when I do these stories that I'm doing no harm that I'm actually giving them the information. I don't want people to leave with the information thinking, well, if I just take some mushrooms, I'm gonna be fine. Yeah. Right. No, right. this is intensive therapy using right. mushrooms as part of that and the, the door opener essentially. And I wanted to make sure that information got across. And so oh, that's great. I would not have done the story yeah. without that. And well, we, did. we, we uh, admire the Veteran Affairs uh, Organization. And uh, I think one of the logical pieces of this is this is where the patients are, right? With PTSD. Exactly. And, we're making the point that in the country's network of community health centers, 30 million patients. Also disproportionately, this is where the patients who are not finding relief from PTSD in any other way are, and we're hoping we'll see them come into the same area of research. And speaking of research, I know one of the areas you're going to be talking with people about here are the Advanced Research Projects Agency uh, that's been created. Uh, not sure how much across the country people got it. This was big news, but a new research agency, two point. $5 billion, not as much as they wanted, but still significant funding. What do you think they're going to contribute 
uh, to the to the <laughs> nation and the world's understanding with their projects? What are they going to focus on? Yeah, it's going to be an interesting conversation because it's with uh, Renee Wegerson. She's right. the, the director, Dr. Wegerson, and then also uh, Dr. Andrews. She's one of the heads of the futures of what's going yep. on with them. Um, and the interesting part is, you know, looking at one, how they were formed, why they were formed, and what kind of template they're using. And so well, the best way I explain it to people is because everybody I talk to pretty much, you know, 98% of people I talk about ARPA-H, and they're like, what? what's that? Well, that's ARPA-H. <laughs> and I'm like, well, have you ever heard of DARPA? And DARPA is the Defense sure. Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they're the ones, and the best way I describe it is... It's a funding agency, which I, through my own investigation, you know, research found out. I thought it was a room full of mad scientists, but no, it's a funding agency <laughs> that funds mad scientists. And these are people that go out there and they just essentially, for lack of a better term, they throw mud against the wall. And they do that for decades and just trying to see what they can come up with. And they have tons of failures. Yeah. But what Renee was telling me about, we're going to find out ARPA when we go through the conversation here, is they consider failure a success because it's showing them what they can do next time and then the next time. And they're not looking at having one or two years of having something succeed. They're looking at decades. The best example I can give you is DARPA. DARPA probably spent 30 years failing, just tons of money getting from the government and failing and failing and failing. And finally, they had that one success and we have the Internet. That's right. Fail forward. Same thing. Something. Fail, fail, <laughs> fail. Lots of money. One success, GPS. That's right. yep. and so these things that have changed our lives, and that's what they want to do with health, these moonshots. The first one they're going to do is for osteoarthritis, which, you know, as we get older, sure. and I'm, I'm a victim of it like anybody else. You know, yep. it's, it's just your joints get worn out and they're trying to, they're not trying to treat it. They want to cure it, yep. which is impressive. And so it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, the interesting part is going to be how they get looked at financially because money runs everything. Right. And if, if the funders, who are essentially Congress, if the funders can look back and say, you know, let's hands off for a few years, we don't need successes right away. Let's let them run with this and see what happens. And we have all the other institutes of NIH so worries about turf or control, how do you, yeah. is it your process that's different versus your and, focus And that's area? what we're gonna talk about tomorrow in the, the, the discussion, because one of the controversies when it first was formed, over the, it was formed a year ago, right. and it took them a few months to figure out where they were gonna yeah. sit as far as in, in the different, in the hierarchy. The, um, most, a lot of people wanted them to be independent, much like DARPA respond, right. reports to the DOD. And they wanted them that level where they responded to HHS and not be in the NIH. Well, they put them in the NIH, and for probably good reasons, we're going to find out tomorrow why they did that and if that's going to hinder them at any point. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, there, there's a lot of controversy there for people who supported it but didn't want that particular location. So we'll look forward to you breaking oh, news, great, yeah. <laughs> sharing that. But, you know, Margaret just mentioned that we're part of a community health center network that cares for 30 million Americans across the country. And one of the groups that we are very focused in on is Hispanic Americans. Oh, actually, as a Hispanic yes. American, you know the issues, uh, both as a physician, as a journalist, uh, around the prevalence of diabetes and obesity. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are of how we can shine a light and do better, not only journalists, but healthcare providers in this particular area. So important. Our population continues to grow rapidly with Hispanic Americans, adding such value to our, our nation. Uh, but this is a health issue that we have to tackle head on. It is a health issue. And, and part of it is that communication piece we talked about right. earlier. And there's nothing more important than getting that communication piece under control and for them to trust the physicians, the physician assistants, the nurse practitioners, the yeah. nurses, their healthcare team they're working with that trust that answer because it's very common, especially in the Latino community, to get your health information from your friend, your neighbor, That's your right. church. From and so, <laughs> yeah, if, if that information you're getting from your friend, your family, your neighbor, your church is incorrect, it's still going to be this information that you believe in thoroughly because that's a trusted person that told it to you versus a doctor who you might not trust. Part of that is obviously is the, you know, having people that look like you treating you. Absolutely. And that's an important step. And they're making strides in trying to get more Latinos in health care, more blacks in health care, more Asians and American Indians in health care, you know, so they can treat their populations. The other thing is getting down to those community levels. Because it's one thing being in an academic institute and them coming to you and you're in your what we call the white tower of going, right. you know, right. this is what you should do right. because I'm the doctor and I'm telling you versus down at the community where you're working with the, the leaders of the, te of the city you're in, the community you're in, and they're working in conjunction with you to get that message across. And that's one thing we found out early in the pandemic, especially with vaccine 
trusting the vaccines right. is getting those leaders, Absolutely. community leaders to say, yes, I got the vaccine. I trust it. You need to get it too. But you're, I think you are spot on when you talk about this workforce development and that we still need to do better. The numbers are appallingly ter- uh, you know, outlandish in terms of how low they are. Thoughts as a leader, as somebody that people look up to, how can we make that how can we make that leap? leap? Any sort of practical advice of encouraging young people as they think about their careers, why healthcare is such a great opportunity. And, and you know, the, the number one, just continue to tout the, the healthcare and how it's a great opportunity. Uh, a lot of times they, they come from, especially where I come from in New Mexico, you know, these are poor populations right. and poor communities that they're just, they're, they're just working to survive. Right. Essentially, they're trying to get to that next level of just, you know, feeding their family and making sure their family's clothed and housed and taken care of that Maslow hierarchy. They're still way at the top of that. But, you know, it, 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 un- it it's interesting that simple, simple things can actually make a big turn in somebody's uh-huh. life. And for me, it was back in high school. It was a biology teacher in high school that one day just out of the blue said, you're smart. You should think about going into medicine. You should, be, you should become a doctor. Yes. First person to ever say that. Really? Yeah. I was that one great? of the first people in my family to ever go to college. And it was just like one of these things that I didn't even think about. I, was, I went to the Air Force Academy. Yeah. I became a pilot. And then four years later, I met somebody who was trying to go to med school. And I, I hearkened back to that guy telling yeah. me that. And I was like, wait a minute. Wow. I can yeah. do this. So all it takes is somebody giving you that little bit that of encouragement. Comfort. And that's mentoring. And that, that's up to us, you know, like the, the me's of the world of going into the community and saying, yeah. you know, you can do this. You can follow my footsteps yeah. or you can follow in that person's footsteps. And so wow. I, I'm very proud of in my family. We have you know, my extended family. We have one, two, three physician or two physicians. One's about to be a physician. One just became a veteran. And this is Isn't my extended family of you know cousins and uncles and aunts. So kudos. Congratulations. Absolutely. And the power of teachers always with that <laughs> exactly. encouragement. You know, you have a uh, to say that you have a diverse portfolio of interests would be an understatement. <laughs> but one of them that I'm not sure everybody is so familiar with is your work with NATO special yes. forces and particularly uh, in uh, combatant care and training uh, combatants for the casualties that one encounters uh, in the battlefield. We, uh, like everybody, have been focused on Ukraine, what is happening on the ground, both to civilians and to their incredible fighting forces. Right. Uh, early on in the uh, right. in this uh, war, we had the chance to talk to some of the physicians there uh, in the community. But oh, what is what is happening on the battlefields? Are we able to help? Are we learning anything new about how to respond to people in these kinds of conflicts? And, and so we are helping, which is great. We're not helping as much as we'd like to. And that's because of severe political constraints we have, because right yeah. now NATO is very adamant about making sure that they're not involved. Because if NATO becomes involved, as in if they step over the border, that becomes right. a completely, completely right. different conflict. It becomes almost a world type conflict and everybody wants to avoid that. So we're helping them as best we can without getting physically involved in their country. At the same time, what we are doing is we are bringing them out to train them and make sure they understand. I've trained some of the Ukrainians myself of, you know, getting them to understand how, you know, how they can take care of people. In my perspective, you know, that tactical combat casualty care we're talking about, not only how do they use that, which is essentially how to treat somebody in the battlefield Mm -hmm. when you're still being attacked, how to take care of them in different phases of the battle. But also, you know, what to do further down the line and how to become a leader to train other people in your country how to do this. And so we're we're doing essentially the pay it forward model of training people that can uh, then go back to their country and train more people. And from what we've heard talking to them, they've had very good successes yeah. of getting this implemented and, and getting this to their people and making sure that it's working. Like you mentioned, you know, they have both they, they have the, the comprehensive defense issue going on right yeah. now, which is essentially the whole country is that war and the whole country is behind the war. And, you know, they're all doing their part to make sure that it is, that basically they can get it taken care of like they need to. What I tell people here in the U.S. is yes, I do teach tactical combat casualty care to NATO special forces. At the same time, part of that is tourniquet care, you know, right. making sure, you know, right. which is Stop the Bleed, which yeah. is a program here yeah. in the United States. And unfortunately here in the U.S. with the shooting incidents that have happened at a rapid pace over the last few years, you know, that's becoming more and more realistic. Right. And we actually did a story pre-pandemic at a school in, I think it was Georgia, you know, forgive me if I get the wrong state, but I think it was Georgia, where they are teaching the students how to stop a bleed which is in in my life, I never would have thought that would happen, but become part of our standard first responder training. It's unfortunately the reality of what needs to happen. And so speaking of leaders, you are somebody who's traveled to Central and South America on humanitarian trips, but you also have interest in the South Pole. 
uh, and maybe you could tell people, I mean, you, you're a globalist, uh, somebody who really uh, understands the value of everybody in, in every location, but how did the South Pole happened. The South Pole, so it was, it was called Operation Ice Cube. It was with the Air National Guard. And the, they just thought that was a catchy name. And it, it is. Like, to be honest, I can't remember what it, it stands for. But it, you go down there. I was a flight surgeon in the Air Force. Yeah. And so I went down there as a flight surgeon to McMurdo, which is the base we have on right. the continent down there. And McMurdo has about a thousand people. And probably two or 300 of those are military, including flyers. They bring C-130s in there yeah. and they bring C-17s in there and then they pull them out. This is during their summer months and it's only a very short time period. The issue is the way it works in flight medicine and the way it works when you're flying, and I was on both sides of that coin because I was a pilot and then became a flight surgeon, the doctor for the pilots, is if you become sick, only a flight surgeon can release you from that and let you go back to flying status. Huh. And so because of that stipulation, and it's a very good stipulation because we're trained in medicine that could be taking place at altitude, which is different. So because of that stipulation, they have to have a flight surgeon on the continent in case one of their flight crews gets sick. Anybody can keep them off from flying, but as a flight doc, I was the only one that could actually put them back on huh. flying status. And so we would go down there for that. Since we were there, they said, okay, we're gonna get other things for you to do as well, so you're not just sitting around. And so we worked our shifts in the clinic they have there. It's a 24-7 you know, urgent care slash ER kind of clinic they have there. And so we would work our shifts there day and night. And my other responsibility was evacuations out of the South Pole. And so I ended up, I was there about 15 hours and I was working, there's a two-day transition between you and the older flight surgeon, the flight surgeon who's leaving. And so they talked to you about the systems and how the computer works and where all the medicines are and blah, 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 all the good stuff. And 15 hours after I was there, we were in a cafeteria and somebody came in and said, hey, we got HAPE, which is high altitude pulmonary edema. HAPE at the South Pole needs a vac, emergency evacuation, planes leaving in 10 minutes. And they looked at the other flight doc who was there and he said, I'm leaving tomorrow. I want to go to the South Pole. You want to go? I'm like, I'll go. And so I went to the South Pole. And essentially what we do is you, you take the C-130 down there. It's so cold in the South Pole that they can't stop the engines wow. because the oil will freeze. will freeze. And so they have to keep it running. And so while they keep it running, you go and you get the patient. And the patient had high altitude pulmonary edema, was very sick, brought him onto the airplane, ended up evacuating him. The cure for high altitude, pul high altitude pulmonary edema is getting is down to the low altitude. <laughs> right. McMurdo's at sea level. And the thing most people don't realize is the South Pole is about nine to 10,000 feet. It's very high altitude. Yeah. And so I did that one. And then about two weeks later, I had to do a second evacuation out of the South Pole. Wow. And so I got to go there twice, which is interesting. It's very, very remote location, obviously, very small. There's probably, 80, 80 people there yeah. all in that wow. in that research station. Uh, but it, it's very a unique it's situation. Important. It's very important and a unique situation. <laughs> glad I, can, I can't imagine the conversations in your household, the kind of, honey, what did you do today? <laughs> Questions well, of, I was, uh, is that well, the well, the funny part is I got to give kudos to my wife, <laughs> Linda, because about, and this is, I think, pre-pandemic. There was somebody, or it might have been after the pandemic, but there was um, somebody that had to get evacuated. I think this was in the last year or so. Had to get evacuated from the South Pole. I can't remember who it was, but it was, uh -huh. uh, it was a, a scientist or celebrity or somebody uh -huh. had to get evacuated from the South Pole. And so we were doing a story, and I was about to go on MSNBC talking about it. And my wife texted me real quick. She goes, don't forget, you went to the South Pole. And I was like... Oh yeah, I forgot. You know, I don't know how you can forget that, but I did. And she, so I told them, they're like, "Holy God, you have pictures!" And she was able to send some pictures real Isn't quick. Right. So put them on about my time down there. But interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, turning to a different page in your your varied uh, career, you have a, a book, Doctor oh, yeah. Disaster's Guide to Surviving. Happy to bring it shamelessly. Essential, <laughs> essential advice for any situation yeah. life throws your way. And, and this is kind of a remarkable book that gives advice on everything from what to do uh, in an airplane, maybe where you should sit to increase your chances of getting out, uh, but also what you should do when you walk into a public space, perhaps like a mall. And uh, as Mark and I were talking, you know, we're hearing this even from staff and healthcare organizations. I'm sure in the emergency room you hear it, you hear it in primary care centers. How do I protect myself? What do I need to know? Exactly. What's your What's your advice on that, both people at large and maybe a little bit specifically uh, to people in healthcare? Because the news, like the schools, has certainly been full of instances. And it's happening. And, and talking to my compatriots in the healthcare industry, especially in the emergency room, yeah. regardless of where you are in the staff, you know, tech, a nurse, a, a PA, a nurse practitioner, a doctor, the, um, yeah, there, there's that violence factor that's always yeah. sitting in the back of your mind going, is something going to happen? And throughout my career in the ER, you know, there's patients that have taken swings at me and there's patients that have been violent, but it was very rare 
not so much anymore now. And there's a lot of anger when they yeah. get in there. So uh, as my wife, who also I'll give her kudos to this, she always had this expression. She's a, a counselor. She always has this expression. The outward expression of fear is anger. Yeah. And so oftentimes, and I would tell people that my, the staff I was working with, hey, if they're angry, it could be because they're afraid of something. They're afraid yeah, of dying. Yes. They're afraid yeah. of this illness they have. They're afraid of you giving them some bad news. And so just remember that, number one. But also, number two, protect yourself and always be aware of what's going on. And regardless of what situation you are in life, and one of the things I always bring up in a book is, you know, my family jokes around, keep your head on a swivel. And that doesn't mean you constantly have to strain your neck and the next day you're sore, but just always understand your surroundings. And nothing uh, kind of doesn't surprise me, but I always uh, sit there going, ah, they shouldn't be doing that. As people walking down the street on their cell phones, texting, and they're in the middle of an area that might be a little bit sketchy, but they're yeah. not paying attention. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's easy for somebody to come up behind them. It's easier in the ER if you're not paying attention and you're doing, you know, the work you need to be doing, but you're not having that third eye paying attention there. You know, things could happen. So, you know, in the emergency room, I always tell them a couple of things. And we were taught this when I was a student and when I was a resident is, you know, number one, never wear a tie because that's something they could right. just grab and right. use. Number two, always give them an exit. And so if I was here and the door is there, I'm going to, you know, if you want to run, I'm not right. going to, I'm not going right. to, I'm not the guy to stop you. You right. know, I'm not going to get in your way because that between me and you is violence. And so you got to yeah. be careful. And just keep an eye on yourself and just, you know, have that help always around, too, in case you need it. And, and, and most of the hospitals are set up where they have code words they can use right. if somebody needs help. And so it's good. Well, in addition for our uh, listeners to read this book, uh, Doctor's Disaster Guide to Surviving Everything, yeah. thinking about consumers and how they're digesting information and what advice you have for them about how to select Amongst all oh, the things, I think it. we started yeah. out, you know, hey, I saw, uh, I had three patients, it worked on two of them, yeah. and everybody says I can use it. But what, what's, what's some advice for your listeners as well, who, who, who really know that you've curated the information, but people are grabbing it from all sorts of places. So uh, a couple of things. And one is, you know, try to find those trusted sources. And there are some trusted sources out there. And I know a lot of people often don't trust the government, but yeah. they do give out some information. Part of the reason for the miscommunication is because their information, especially the CDC and the FDA, you know, their information is very science based and science founded. And so they can't really change their information much unless that science changes, whereas other people can be more freewheeling as far as this is what I think or this sure. is my opinion. They don't do that. They give sound information. So if you're getting it from those sources, it takes some uh, solace in the fact that it's very good sound information you're getting out. So those are good sources. And then look at other sources. You know, large hospital systems have great sources of information. The, the different colleges, the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, American Medical Society, mm -hmm. American College of, of Cardiology, you know, those guys have great, great sources of information. They're fantastic. And then just kind of cultivate the people that you've listened to. I would lean more towards people who have expertise in that area, who yeah. have e either science or medicine backgrounds and they understand it versus people who are just you know, popular because they're influencers or on a talk show and they have their opinions of things. You know, th th but you know, look at that. On top of that, if you do get information, whether it's from the CDC, whether it's from me, whether it's from social media, second check that, third check it. You know, yeah. Just look at other sources. And if you get something from a source you think might be a little, little questionable, look at a sound source. And then look at a second sound source and make sure you get that information. And one thing when my kids were growing up, I used to always teach them, and I used it throughout life a lot, is I always use this, this question of, does that make sense? Yeah. When you talk to somebody, you know, does that make sense? And if the answer is yes, then great. If the answer is I don't know or questionable or no, then don't go that route. And so just, you know, we all have that, that gut feeling, and you just look at something, and you go, does, does, it, you know, does it make sense that they put microchips in vaccines. Why would the government do that? That doesn't right. make sense, you know? Does it make sense that they would put magnets in there? We well, laugh, but other people don't No, laugh. they, they yeah. don't. And, but I'm just saying, using that, using that doesn't make sense that they put microchips in there when they can track you by your cell phone That's anyway. Right. They don't need microchips. <laughs> that, that, that just, again, using that, and, and not to ridicule people, but using that, does that make sense thing yeah. when you hear something like that? And then using that kind of gut feeling of, okay, let me check deeper and see if that really could come to fruition. Great advice. Yeah. I want to uh, go back to your role as a physician and, and what you see particularly in the emergency room setting. And I know uh, here uh, at this wonderful conference, there's going to be a session on healing the healer, overcoming burnout. We hear a lot about moral injury, which within healthcare has come to mean something to people who are at the front lines. What are you seeing? I think you're primarily in the emergency setting, yeah. but you know, you're confronted with both the things that you can fix, right? The traumatic injury, the car injury, hopefully you can fix it. 
uh, but also the chronic psychiatric patient who has nowhere to go, the person who's sleeping on the streets, the, the uh, individuals who uh, just have so much stacked against them. Very hard for emergency room people to respond. What are you seeing in terms of helpful strategies? What do people need? What do they need us to know? about what's going on. You know, it was interesting. I was just talking with a couple of doctors yesterday about this. And it's one of those things that a lot of times people will say, wow, it's, you know, there's that burnout because you're working so hard and you're doing stuff. And the, the consensus was we, we've always worked hard. Right. You know, medicine is just that stressful. kind of, yeah, medicine is just that kind of field where it's stressful. You work hard, long hours, and you're happy to go back and do it again. You're happy yeah. to keep doing it because you're making progress. You're helping people out. The people that you can't help, you're trying to make as comfortable as possible. And you're, you're basically taking care of people. What comes into that equation are the things that you can't take, you can't handle, that you don't, you don't have any power over. And part of that's the hospital administration. Part of that's the, the long waiting periods in the ER before they get upstairs. Part of that is the, you know, where do you take, where does you send people that might have psychiatric issues right. when there are no psychiatric centers to send them to? Where do you send the homeless other than out on the street when they need, you know, one of the big things is, let's say they had surgery done. They're gonna need right. a week or so yep. of recovery you can't recover on the street and attend under a bridge, right. you know, where do you send them? You don't. And so that starts wearing on you. And that starts getting you that, that injury you're talking about, that moral injury of like, I, I'm trying to take care of my patients as best I can, but I'm not doing all that they need because of these other issues that are happening peripherally that I don't have any control over. And like I said, you know, doctors, nurses, techs, we, we all have worked hard our whole careers. And we knew that coming in right. because that's what you do in med school. And that's what you do in residency. I mean, you work unbelievably hard, long hours, but you're making headway. It's when you stop making that headway and you're butting your head against the wall trying to get things taken care of that aren't moving in the direction that they need to move in that you start getting that, that, that it starts impacting you mm -hmm. emotionally. Speaking of headway, we're here at the Aspen Institute, Ideas on Health. What a great opportunity oh, to move, move the conversation forward. What are, what are you picking up here? Uh, and I should just remind people, this is not a green <laughs> no, screen. That's the main Dr. Thing. John and I will be running back there later just to show that it's not a green screen. Uh, but, you know, you're just fascinating people here. Oh. Uh, I also know that you are, uh, NBC's uh, been a big sponsor and, and a facilitator here. But tell us, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about the experience the excitement that's brimming here. Yeah, and, and this is a fantastic one. This is my eighth year being here, and I wow. love coming yeah. here. And the main reason is because you see all the people that are either doing the, the state-of-the-arts research, or yeah. they are the funders for that research, yeah. or they're the policy makers behind all that, and they're the ones that are moving it in a certain direction, and hopefully in the direction you want it to go in. And so part of what happens here are people making those decisions and making those contacts as to, you know, what do we want to do moving forward and getting ideas. And that's the idea about it. This is the Ideas, ideas. Festival, which yeah. is great because they get ideas just talking to people. And as opposed to most things where you, know, you, you talk to the, the, the head of HHS or you talk to the head of the FDA or you talk to the head of the CDC and they're in their official capacity right. where they're doing their official thing and they have to give the official answer here, they open up a little bit and they're able to do things more casually. And it's, it's very common to be having a coffee with somebody and there's coffee distributors all over the campus here. You have yeah. a coffee with somebody and you're talking to them and, and it, the conversation is usually, so what do you do? What do you do? Well, I'm the, <laughs> you know, I'm a physician, I'm the medical correspondent for NBC. Oh yeah, I'm the head of the FDA. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Let's see if we can come up with a story. Let's see if we can come up with an idea. Absolutely. Or or I'm head right. of the Commonwealth Fund. You know, this just great fund That's that right. funds a lot of research and studies, you know, and, and just talking to them. It's like, here's the things we're looking at going forward. What kind of ideas do you have? And, you know, do you have any, any thoughts about how we could get better coverage for this on TV? Yeah, great. And so you come up with a lot of ideas. And I think the beauty behind the Aspen festivals here is it lets people come in a very casual environment. The first year, the, the funny thing is the first year I came here, I was living in New York and I came in my suit and my tie, you know, my fancy suit with my nice <laughs> shoes, my tie and everything. And I was going to moderate a panel and I showed up for the panel. They're like, what are you doing? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> yeah. They're like, take the tie off, throw the jacket out, you know, kind of thing. And then the, the next year I realized it's, you know, very casual environment. And yeah. so I tell the people I'm on the panel with when I'm moderating it, we do a pre-interview. I said, you know, number one, you know, business casual or less type clothes. You know, you're going to have a great time here. Just have fun doing this. And we get out a lot of good information. Great. Well, Margaret, we have we couldn't, to... couldn't agree with you more on that one. <laughs> one night last night, we met more people, many of whom we've interviewed on the show, many of whom we follow actively, and others we've just admired from a distance. Oh, yeah. Isn't so, amazing? Wonderful to be here. Dr. John, such a pleasure to make uh, your you appointments, bet. to learn more well, about you your guys. work, and to bring it out uh, to our listeners and to all of our listeners or viewers. What a pleasure for us to join you from Aspen, from the Festival of Ideas Health. And you can always learn more about conversations on healthcare by going to chcradio.com. Dr. John, 
Thanks. We look Thank forward you. to oh, getting to so, know you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> really appreciate All right. it. This copyrighted program is produced by Conversations on Healthcare and cannot be reproduced or retransmitted in whole or in part without the express written consent from Community Health Center, Inc. The views expressed by guests are their own, and they do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Conversations on Healthcare or its affiliated entities.